going live. I'm live. I went live really quick. I don't know if I was ready, but we are on. <laughs> okay, what's up, everybody? Hold on, we can bring this in. All right. Okay, now we're set. I wasn't quite trying to hit that button yet, but we're just gonna go for it. Hey everybody, my name is Garrett Hartle. A lot of you guys who are watching, I'm sure already know who I am, but this is Reach Out Reptiles. And maybe you're not watching this live, but we could still really use your help. So this week for Free Tip Friday, what I really wanna do is begin implementing a few subtle changes on the channel. Um, and one of the things is I really wanna strive to get your guys' input on what happens on the channel here. And so, what I'd really like to do, can you see comments yet? No. We've got some rolling. Um, what I would really like to do with you guys is just take, I've only got about a half an hour here because I've got a pack for a reptile show, the Steel City Expo, um, this weekend. But I wanted to jot down with Ashley and Finley here. Come here, Finn. Um, I wanted to jot down a few of your guys' ideas for what we should do here on these Free Tip Fridays. So Ashley will probably, uh, can you read us off a list? We actually have been keeping a list of the things that you guys have mentioned in the comments since the beginning of this channel. Uh, some of the topics are things that we may or may not discuss. I mean, that's up to our discretion. Some of them are kind of politically polarized and things like that that we'd probably stay away from. Not that we're really afraid to address reality here. But we have a, a good list of stuff, but I really would like to dig in. Having a, a wide variety of available topics that are applicable to you guys really helps me in the whole creative process on the channel here. So, are you able to see any of the comments? Yeah. I don't think anybody's watching yet because it's in the I saw some. It. I saw some comments jumping up. On YouTube? Yep. Oh, sorry. Scrolling? Oh, sorry. Yep, there you are. Hey, everyone. Sorry, I don't know how to use YouTube. Oh, that's a good one. Who says they want to see the snakes? Uh, Nathan C. Okay, Nathan, yeah, we'll put that one on the list for sure. Um, I did actually I do... I means right now. Oh, well, we got, we got babies right now, so we don't, we don't do babies and the snakes. Baby one hand, snake in the other hand. But, um, but yeah, I did actually do a little reptile room tour with a lot of the, the newer babies stuff that I have in stock and everything like that. Um, I don't often show too many of my my actual breeders though with some of the projects and things that I'm doing. So I, I'm maybe highlighting some of the quick projects that we have going on here would be a good idea. That might even be something that we could do, you know, like a little project per video or something, like make it like a segment within. The genetic hunters wanna know, want you to see if you could write free tip Friday backwards on the board behind you. Yeah, it's tough. Yeah, that takes talent. Snake collection update. <laughs> snake tour, snake collection update from yep. Alec. Yeah, so same thing. I mean, there obviously we could do an update every week because things are always changing, but I think it was only two, three weeks ago that I did actually do a tour of, uh, of everything as far as babies that I have available. A lot of times around here, especially, the babies are like, way more exciting than the adults because you're the combination of new genetics, new bloodlines, things like that. We're always trying to perfect into further generations. So right. D R T H I K. Okay. Uh, first time vending, prepping for selling at a show. Oh, that's a good one and applicable now. That's a really good idea and I, you know, sometimes I actually feel like too many people think that they need to go vend at shows. And it really is a big deal. I'm kind of a believer in if you're going to do something, do it right. Uh, many of you guys have probably seen my trade show booth. Um, and it's like ridiculously over the top. I'm actually looking for somebody who can come help me set it up tonight because I'm a little bit shorthanded. So, uh, you know, I think sometimes if you're going to just throw down a tablecloth and put some animals on it and sit there and read a book behind it, it's almost better that you not bend. You know, um, but uh, but obviously there are circumstances where you do want to. So I think that's a good one. We'll put, put that on there. Thank you. Uh, Marshall Law, Marcia, about a video on how you set up your expo booth. 
Oh yeah, cool. That yeah, that's a good one, Marshall. Um, my booth is a little bit, like I said, kind of over the top. I don't know that I would recommend the same booth for for everybody. Um, you know, I've as a as a full time breeder, it's a probably a whole lot different than if you were a hobbyist. So first big snake to start with. First big snake to start with. Yeah. Okay. That's good. Young zoologist club. Yeah, we can do that. That's a that's a great idea. I mean, obviously, I'm going to be biased in this. Um, it sort of depends on what person you are, but Sorry. with the dwarf and super dwarf retics, one of the things that's really cool is that you can learn and add to your collection. So you can start out with something very small. A lot of people don't realize some of the smallest lines of super dwarves are literally corn snake sized or, or maybe just a little bit bigger. So you could start from there and build your way up if you want and work within the same species, ending up with a breeding group in the end. So. All right, Derek, Raymond, how do you feel about house to ball pythons in a 70 gallon tank with five hides? I have a male and female ball python, but about a year old, thanks. Um, well, without getting into like too much of that kind of stuff, um, I, I think everyone needs to figure out what's right on their own and with their animals. Um, I seriously doubt that wild ball pythons have access to things the size of a 75 gallon uh, terrarium that they're going to live in on a daily basis. Um, you know, I think they're more living in subterranean burrows that are tight and dark. Uh, and then they obviously are going to come out and move around from time to time, but keeping them in a, a small secure cage most of the time and then catching up with them as they move around and sort of like taking them out of the enclosure so uh but that being said i mean your snakes may love it you know every, every snake is a little bit different um i know that with my snakes with the super dwarf retakes they do great in big displays so um uh, benjamin felter if the super dwarf is overfed is it possible to put them on a diet healthy safe and safely and then also the that's a good question transportation techniques on different species Let's let's do one called uh, My Snake's Too Fat. I like that. Seventh grade math teacher booty for those of you guys who've been watching the channel for a long time. Um, but that's a that's a great topic because I've actually had to diet several snakes um, when you know when, as I pick up other people's breeding collections and stuff. What's up, Finley? You wanna say hi? Can you say hi to everybody? Everybody look at Finn. What is your favorite retic morph from all things dragons? My favorite retic morph? Should we have like a little Garrett? That's a good one. My favorite retic morphs. It's a, that's actually a, like probably a long answer. I mean, everyone knows I, I love working with Annery. I tend towards the subtle stuff, but there's a lot of morphs that I like for particular reasons that I, uh, you know, and they dictate some of the projects that I do. Um, for my own personal enjoyment and it would be cool for me to just sit down and explain why I like what I like uh, what is, or Tell us how you keep the smell down in your reptile room Joseph Hall right now. I don't <laughs> <laughs> Right now, it's pretty bad if I turn the camera around we've been cleaning furiously all day So uh, the room gets tore apart when we're cleaning and then we have to go through and and clean the actual outside of the room, but it's never a priority for my side of the room to be clean. It's just the animals, you know. And you know that, Joseph. Don't mess. <laughs> um. But I, I actually do have uh, venting and stuff like that. So why don't we do this? This brings up a good idea. Considerations for building a reptile room. Hold on. Because, Joseph, to answer your question, um, I think if you know a lot of times when people get to the point of like okay I'm gonna dedicate a room a garage a basement a shed or whatever to my hobby collection what are some of the things to get take into consideration when I do that because obviously you can do whatever you want inside the room but if the shell itself doesn't work well you're gonna be fighting it forever Brian Pesco wants to know why uh, you're making me slave away on the computer. Oh, well, I make my whole family slave away all the time. That's what family's for, right? Uh, favorite snake species outside of... And I slave away for them, too. I was trying to get a laugh out of her, but maybe she's laughing. We can't see her. you got to turn this way and say hi. Oh, she's being shy. Um, uh, okay, 
favorite snake species outside of Retex from Random RG. Favorite, favorite what? Oh, favorite snake species? Um, Personal? Out of Retex. Oh my All God. things dragon favorite lizard type. Okay, these are good questions, but rather than do a free tip Friday on those, I'm going to actually answer those right now. Well, snakes? Quick. Snakes, I love, I love everything. I mean everything. But I tend towards the extreme. I'm actually a huge fan of venomous stuff, even though I don't keep any now. Um, I, I was kind of unusual. I started with venomous snakes and worked my way backwards from there. So um, I love venomous stuff. I would have to say like probably some of the rattlesnakes are my favorites. Um, if I could like, you know, keep a dream species that's like not even possible right now, I think it would be sea snakes. Uh, I'm fascinated by those. Nobody really keeps those too well in captivity. So if there was a way to do it, that would be cool. Lizard species, I mean, I don't know, I think I gotta cop out and say Komodo dragon because they really are cool. I've been there a handful of times uh, to see them in the wild and they're incredible. But I also like a really nice lace monitor. Um, probably my favorite would be a Parenti. Uh, you know what, I think I would like a Parenti over a uh, Komodo dragon actually. You got a bowl. It probably has flavor. That was daddy's pretzel bowl, I think. Wanna lick some salt? Um. <laughs> so parentes for the for the lizards and then um, snakes uh, probably sea snakes what uh, do you uh, Regan's Reagan, sorry reptiles and more do you feed your snakes other animals besides rats absolutely well, there's actually a whole video about providing a varied diet for the reptiles and if you scroll down my video list you'll see it um, I try to I try to personally give as much variety as possible, and I, I don't know if that works for every snake species, but retics rarely miss a meal. They like to eat everything, so I like to give them a variety. Some stuff will get spoiled uh, if you try a new species with them, in particular ball pythons. So if you're watching this and you have ball pythons, I wouldn't recommend you go give it like a chick or a baby bunny or something like that because you may never get them off it. All right, uh, Marshall Longmore, so with all your experience with different snakes over the years, what made you choose Super Dwarfs? Uh, obviously, Marshall, you've never had a Super Dwarf. So top or this, five reasons super, we this, Super Dwarfs? Yeah, okay, that's a good one. I don't know if you guys heard that. Ashley wrote that down as a free tip Friday. Top five reasons Super Dwarfs are the best. Well, so. I say that. <laughs> uh, reptile transportation techniques again. Uh, Wait, reptile transportation techniques? I didn't yeah. hear that one before. Oh, so I wrote earlier from the genetic hunters. That's a really good one, oh, especially sorry, if you're doing, I didn't write especially if you're doing like uh, wild rescues and relocation or educational shows. Um, uh, but even just moving a collection. So I do a lot genetic hunters on shipping uh, because I think there's a lot of people who do that horribly, uh, and I almost everyone I know has stories about that. So if that's what you're talking about, you might want to check those out. But as far as transportation goes, like to the shows and back, excellent question. Uh, flesh cleaver. Unique ways to house snakes if you don't have room for a dedicated reptile room. Oh, that's a very good one. So, um, yeah, I mean, o over the years I've, I've done, I'm kind of like a DIY sort of a guy. So I've built all kinds of enclosures. In another lifetime, I, I was actually paid to professionally build like large display enclosures for private breeders, things that were like full, you know, biodomes basically and stuff like that. So you can really do some cool stuff with it um, within your house. But you just always want to consider, the main things to consider are the foot traffic and not really like noise levels, but like the vibrations and stuff of the areas that you're in. It's, I think, always better to either go with a quieter area of the house or create a lot of hides and, you know, you can overcome things in certain ways. What's up? I agree with Someone's you. Someone's laughing. Because Benjamin, Benjamin, Ashley Superdors are the best. Okay, I gotcha. I hear you. Uh, what's Benjamin Felter? Again, what a good venomous, what is a good venomous uh, starter snake? Random <laughs> RG said hog nose. Aren't they ring fat, rare fat? Rear fang. Yeah, I don't know if there's such a thing as a venomous starter snake for a first snake, but um, I have, I mean, you know, if you want to do this, go hit up Greg Madden on Facebook, but Greg is uh, one of the guys on one of our Talk Em Up Tuesdays who specializes in venomous, and he's going to have a lot better answers, but I would personally say 
the best thing to start with in Venomous. Obviously, you're going to have to be very experienced before you make that jump. And uh, I would even uh, work with somebody who's kept those Venomous as kind of an apprentice to learn proper techniques and safety. That's the thing that most people don't do. But the, the best one is going to be the one that anti-venom is available for. So in a lot of cases, you know, people are like, oh, check out this exotic species. They're not too bad and they're mild tempered, but they're from some random country that you can't get any anti-venom for. And if you get bit, you're, you're screwed. Whereas if I'm bit by something that is local, that they have the anti-venom for at the hospital with bite protocol and how to treat it and everything, um, I'm going to have a lot better uh luck with that kind of stuff so i would say keep that in mind what happens the biggest question for any venomous thing is what happens when you get bit so okay any more ideas that you guys want for free tip fridays things that you would like to uh, hear me talk about for shows and educational show and tell for different groups what is this say it again uh for shows and educational show and tell for different groups is that a question? <laughs> Genetic hunters, help us out here. Um, I've done personally done like hundreds, possibly thousands of educational uh, different things and stuff like that. So I'm not sure if that's what you're talking about. But babe, why don't we put down um, how to craft a message for your educational show? And we'll slap genetic hunters on there because one of the things that I always try to do rather than just show and tell with a bunch of animals is craft a message that's woven throughout an educational presentation. And that's true, you know, you can consider the age range that you're going to be talking to. I think a lot of times people talk to elementary school because that's the, um, that's the age group, but you can learn what they're learning in school and complement their education in a way that's hands-on. Or, you know, if it's college level, then, you know, you can approach it from that kind of regard, too. But I craft a message. Brian Cusco, how do you still relate to us normal humans when you're clearly so much more advanced? Uh -huh. Laugh out loud, Marshall. Oh, sorry. What is the worst experience you have had with a snake? Any snake? I don't really relate to you, Brian. I, I'm just more of a spectator. Sit back and enjoy the, um, the train wreck. Um, Mickey Mouse. <laughs> Hi, buddy. Talk for you. Reptile, What's uh, going on? Video Ow. vids on the internet. Keep it up. Love this. Jet genetic hunter. Is it possible for you to pull back your reptilian skin? Just kidding. You seem so in touch. <laughs> Benjamin Felter, I'm thinking a monocled cobra. M -O -N. Monocled cobra? Sorry, yeah. Well, only if you live where they come from. Yeah. Monocled yeah. cobras are common and they're cheap, so that's why a lot of people start with them, but they'll kill you pretty easily. So, you know, just Wait, watch for that. Reagan's reptiles and more. What is the difference between retex and Burmese pythons? Huge differences. Huge. Uh, the main one I, I would think is that Don't the. Don't answer. Are we gonna? Retex versus Burmese. I don't know. I mean, you could. Yeah, that's. Uh, we can do that. Let's do retex versus other pythons, so that we can hit a little bit of a broader audience. But my favorite thing about retics over Burmese, number one, berms tend to musk a lot, which I don't like getting musk. I'd rather be bit than musked on. Not that you have to take a bite from a retic, but uh, the number two thing is uh, berms have a way more health issues uh, over their lifetime, and when you work with a lot of them than retics do, they're much more sensitive. Random RG, have you ever kept a red-tailed boa? All Absolutely. Red, all things dragon, uh, best way to build a reptile enclosure? <laughs> Okay, uh, that that might go into some of the others, but what don't we have one about ways to unique ways to keep reptiles without a reptile room? Yeah. Why don't you just put their name on that one? All right, all things dragon. Because I I think that's a uh, another one, and you know it's funny with the big snakes like like retics, there's not a ton of commercially available products. Even professional cage builders, most of them, their cage building business is their hobby, so. That's a, you know, kind of a must-have for um, if you're going to be serious about big snakes. How about winter? Can you turn the music up a little bit? Oh, okay. Uh, Christopher Sexton, how about up, Chris? when to upscale enclosures? We've seen baby setups and adult setups. How about a guy to size in the sub adults? That's a great idea, and I actually do have on my list, Chris, what is an appropriately sized cage? which I haven't addressed yet because, to be honest, I'm trying to think of like a good formula. For me, it's about a feel for my animal, but obviously that's based on experience. 
And so I'm trying to come up with some kind of like a beginner's guide formula. Hey, buddy. What's the matter, big guy? So that I can share with the rest of you guys uh, what's the best. And, and really, I mean, the challenge would be if you can keep your snake comfortable and secure, bigger is better. Give them all the room that you can afford to. So, where am I at here? Um, let me grab it. Hold on, guys. You can rush for the water. Okay, let's see. Your phone. Yeah. Bedtime for baby. Everyone say bye, Ashley, to the messy room. <laughs> Woo, check out that Freedom Breeder shirt. Representing, we got our, our first Freedom Breeder rack in yesterday, so that's pretty exciting. Um, let's see, everybody please hit the like button, says the Genetic Hunters. Yes, please hit the like button, everybody. Actually, um, I got a call from Dave Kaufman of Dave Kaufman's Reptile Adventures the other day, and he and I were discussing kind of the, the current relevance with YouTube and how to gain exposure and all that. And the one question that, and I love this comment, so if you're listening to this now and you want to make me happy on every video from now on, say, how come you don't have more subscribers? But I think I can answer that for you. It's because none of my videos are monetized. If you notice, there's never been a commercial, there's never been any of that stuff on my videos. I don't do YouTube to make YouTube money. I do it so that I can connect with you guys. And so I was talking with Dave about it, and he was saying, you know what, I think that's actually going to kill you as far as being able to increase the platform because obviously um, YouTube is going to want to promote videos that they make money off of. So if, if there's my video and someone else's video on the same thing, but if they you know, suggest someone else's video, they get ad content, uh, ad whatever it is, uh, compensation, and they won't get it off of mine. They're going to promote that other video instead. So you, you guys might start seeing some commercials on this channel, and it's for the reason that YouTube will help share because, you know, and it, it's kind of like a catch-22 because all of you guys that are subscribed right now, I love you guys. I absolutely love my small, tight-knit knit community because you guys are fantastic and awesome, and I think almost all of my subs have been found through word of mouth. I get a lot more that way than I actually do like the random YouTube crowd. And that's probably why I have so much fun with all of you guys. Um, but if I can increase the platform, you know, I might need you guys to watch my back on that stuff when we start getting all the, the trolls and negativity and things like that that kind of comes along with it. But there's definitely an upside too because you're spreading a good message a positive message on YouTube and making your reach a little further so I did want to make that announcement um, so thank you genetic hunters yeah like subscribe nice shirt Ashley yeah that's a good one Brian uh, I know you like those freedom breeders so and actually guys stay tuned I got a, a freedom breeder it's called a 1040 rack and it's half a rack with a work top they actually customized it for me and I I'm really digging the thermostat that comes with it. So I'm actually gonna do a product review on a Freedom Breeder thermostat for you guys because it's just the nicest thermostat I've ever had, even with much more expensive models. So you guys stay tuned for that one, that's pretty cool. Um, hey Dean Strantulas, how you doing? Yeah, Chris is saying I'm getting derated in search results. <laughs> Thanks Benjamin Felter, you the man. Um, random, I discovered this channel via Reddit that's that's interesting. I get uh, certain people hammering me about getting on Reddit because, and you know, actually advertising there and stuff. So, but but the same point is, you know, applies that I think I'm going to get like a lot broader reach if I do monetize the videos and give a financial reason for YouTube to promote the channel, um, and and then that way we can have a little bit more positivity and, and better education for everybody out there. So, let's see, we could deal with a commercial here and there as long as you continue being you. Thank you, Genetic Hunters. I don't know how to be anybody else, and that's lame anyways, so I don't ever see that happening. Um, I found you when researching if I should get a dwarf retic. I like it. That's the way I like to be found. 
and and a lot of that is search engine optimization but you know I kind of own that niche because uh, I am a dwarf and super dwarf retic specialized breeder. I don't do anything else. No other species. I don't even do mainland retics. So, um, you know, if you're searching those things specifically, I'm not surprised that, that you're finding me on there. That's great. What's up, DER Reptiles? So for those of you guys who are just tuning in, we are asking, what do you want to see here for Free Tip Friday? In other words, what kind of topics would be relevant to you in coming weeks that would keep you interested and engaged or uh, you know do you know what I use free tip Friday videos for you might have seen me doing this on other social media there are certain questions that are very commonly asked um, and like the question how big will my dwarf or super dwarf retic get and that's a loaded question and I'd be sitting typing out long paragraphs over and over for every person that asked it so what I did was I created a free tip Friday video with video and examples and explanations from simple to in-depth so that anybody can understand it and now what I do is when somebody asks that question I can just copy paste and shoot them the link and they can research it on their own so to help you guys think of things to help me out in this what is what are some of the questions that that reptile people or non reptile people who are interested are continually asking you guys or that you find yourselves answering over and over because if it's a good one um, and something that I think is relevant then it's probably a question that I'm getting asked over and over as well so maybe we can make a free tip Friday on that so leave those comments below and even if you guys are watching this and it isn't live shoot those comments down below because I'm gonna read everyone I'll reply to everyone and uh, and any of these videos that don't fit into uh, any of these ideas rather that don't fit into one of my to-do list videos already I'm gonna go ahead and and uh, and make a video out of it if it's a great question so yeah keep those things on there uh, let's see Brian Cusco I missed your question bro what's the question you missed my question, bro. I see you said nice shirt, Ash. Oh, here we go. I see what's going on here now. Here we go. How do you stay focused on projects while working at home? Uh, that's a that's a really tough one. Um, it's probably worthy of an episode. So I will have my ghostwriter do that one. But working from home with reptiles and maintaining focus. Uh, is is not always easy especially with a bunch of kids and stuff like that and you know one of the great things to do Brian whenever people are coming to interrupt you and you obviously this is your family you want to spend time and devote it to them one of the best things you can do that I've found is put them to work say hey dad's working you came and visit me at work that means you get to work too <laughs> and uh, you really get them involved get them educated in it and uh, and if they don't want to work they'll leave if they do then you can work together with them so that's that's one thing I've been doing let's see here I got it yeah Zach thank you Doc Holiday sweet Chris I used that video to decide to buy my first retic well there you go yeah I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about how big does my retic get anyway so yeah it's uh it's a loaded question but that's a that's a good video so take it easy genetic hunters thank you very much for all of your input everybody's jumping off let's see is it possible to breed an albino bat eater yeah um, I mean there have been albinos in 75 percenters towards the berm side so there's no reason you can't it's just hard to breed bat eaters period so if you're gonna breed a, an albino bat eater it, we've proven that the retic Clark strain albino and Burmese albino do not line up so you either want to gamble on another strain of albino being allelic Maybe something like the Amel retic to a uh, albino Burmese and see if those line up in the first generation, get you some albinos. Or you're going to have to breed an albino, you know, let's say you want purple phase bat eaters. So you take a purple retic, a Burmese, you make the hybrids, but you'll have to raise them up and breed them back together again to make that. And that's a whole lot easier said than done. Excuse me. And I suspect that's why it hasn't been done more often that's much better lighting that was blinding myself looking at this video here so yeah absolutely 
possible, um, just hasn't been done. Let's see. Most are mis just misconceptions like I heard them size you up. Oh, yeah. You know what? That would be a good one. I'll have to write that one down, too. Um, I do have one that's like popular misconceptions, but it would be really fun to talk about some of like the just outlandish, dumb reptile rumors that, that go around their old wives tales and things like that. The ones that it seems like it's always like, no, it was my sister's friend. So this is a reliable story. But you hear that same story everywhere you go and it's always like the sister's friend or whatever. Like, yeah, they're, you know, get get out of the house right now. The snake's sizing you up. You shouldn't sleep with your python anymore. What a ridiculous story. But I, I can't believe how many people do believe that stuff. I think it's because they don't pay attention to what's really going on with reptiles, you know? So, all right, guys, I got about maybe five more minutes and I got to jump so I can start packing. Uh, but thank you very much if you've already been on here. Let's see if there's any more good tips for free tips on Fridays. Uh, let's see, Robbie, I've got a normal. If I were to get a male super dwarf, pair him with my female, what, what would they more than likely produce? Well, if you have a normal as in a mainland retic, um, you're going to need to go with a pure super dwarf to make an animal that is a super dwarf as a baby at 50%. But I'll give you two reasons why I wouldn't recommend it. First of all, they're going to be pretty big for a 50% super dwarf if you're using a large mainland female and a smaller male. Um, so kind of what's the point of making normal super dwarves if they're going to be big anyway? Uh, and then secondly, you can't get any morphs on the super dwarf side using a 100% super dwarf with the exception of possibly anery, but I don't know that anyone's going to be, you know, knocking down your doors for a normal head anery that gets pretty big either. So that breeding is probably not the best. Um, to be honest, a, a big mainland female is probably not the best investment level animal to be trying to work into super dwarf projects. If you were gonna have to add mainland blood to a super dwarf, you might as well bring in as many genetic traits as you can so that you can start some morph projects in the super dwarf. Otherwise, why cross them in the first place? Go get a, a super dwarf female, breed to your super dwarf male, um, get a really nice pair, like a locality specific pair, and enjoy them for 30 years while they produce for you and make all kinds of great stuff. I think that's probably a better way to go with that. Um, so I'd say keep your normal as a pet uh, rather than trying to, you know, retrofit and work her into a super dwarf project. Oh, let's see. Uh, Rise inside 88. Hey, I've got a five foot mainland that's pushing a lot. Hasn't done any damage, but it's irritating his nose. You have four by two by one. Any tips? Food helps, but I don't want to overfeed. Normally when they push, there's something agitating them or they want to get out. So some of the tricks you can use is cover over the front of the cage. The biggest thing really is cool your temperatures down. You said you have them in a four foot cage. So in a four by two, you, it's hard to get a good proper gradient. And a lot of times if you take a temperature gun and you shoot that hot end, you'll see that you're hitting 90 or even above. And those temperatures are, are fairly high and really don't need, they don't need that high a temperature. So if he's pushing and he's agitated, I would cool that temperature down to like, I don't know, the, maybe the mid 80s, 85 or so, and then try to keep your cooler side in the upper 70s and see if that helps. Um, that, that might be the difference. So the only time they need a real high temperature like that is if you're giving them a gigantic meal, which can be unsafe anyways. And most people don't do that in captivity anyway, or just really max them out on food intake. Uh, Zach, I'd love to see a video explaining morphs within retics. I'm familiar with some, not all, have a hard time finding that information. There used to be a great website called worldofretics.com that basically was a uh, user-contributed website where if I made a world's first morph, I could publish about it on there and they had a giant list of every morph, every hybrid, everything else done. The problem is in a YouTube format is that that's going to need to be, if I were to tackle every morph, first of all, that's about 24 hour of a video talking about at this speed of every morph and where it came from and what it does. And it, it's also going to need to be updated continually because there are now dozens of new morphs created every year all over the place and some of them we don't even know about. I do plan to start doing some of the history 
on uh, different genetic traits that pertain to dwarf and super dwarf, uh, especially where there are misconceptions like that certain morphs are by nature dwarf or super dwarf, like genetic stripe or phantom or orange ghost or golden child or whatever you may have heard, um, because that's just not true. So um, I do want to do some of that and I'll be able to tackle it. But I, I know a few people that are trying to work on that information. It's just not available right now. It needs to be something that can be continually updated. Okay, let's see. What's the best way to purchase one of my snakes and the best time of year to watch for them? Well, Seth, uh, first of all, hey, thanks for reaching out. I have close to 100 animals in availability right now. And so I don't talk about my available animals and I don't sell them here on YouTube. Everybody also asks me, where do you post your availability list? And the answer is I never do. Most of the breedings that I do, if you follow me, a lot of people have already been interested in those breedings and things that I'm making from a long time ago. So I have a waiting list on a lot of the stuff that I do. Um, but right now I have probably better availability than any time I've started. So just send me a, a private message Tell me, you know, what kind of adult size range are you looking for? What sex, morph, locality? Is this just a pet? Is it going to be for breeding later? Kind of like, what do you hope to accomplish and what's your price range? And I'll give you your options. If I have something that you want, awesome, we'll make it happen. If not, uh, and you really want to get something from me, I'll get you on a waiting list and then you can have your pick before they become available to anybody else. And that's really the only way I've been doing sales and until I, you know, am swimming, even the availability I have now, most of those hundred plus babies or whatever are, haven't even taken enough meals to be shipped yet. I just happen to get like six clutches at once. So, uh, Curtis Power, is there a retic that looks like a banana pied? Uh, well, there are pieds, there are not bananas, but to me, bananas kind of look like a, a lavender retic or a purple retic. So I'm going to say albino pied. Yeah, there's, they're there. Um, they're just not common yet. So uh, they're going to be very expensive. You're talking multiple thousands of dollars. So, but yeah, pied's, pied is pied in both species. Um, so start looking at some different pied retics. And the albino pieds are only just now starting to become kind of like readily available. But you're still paying a few thousand bucks for those. Benjamin Felter, my coworker calls me the snake master. Very good, I like it. You need to post a picture like with uh, a leash and a big spike collar on one of your snakes or something and make it your phone background and mess with them or something like that. No problem, Doc Holiday. Love that name. What's up, true classic never dies? How you doing, man? I'm about to jump off here, but I'm looking for tips again on what I can make a free tip Friday for you guys about. So what are some frequently asked questions that you get all the time or questions that you might have that we can make videos about here in the future? And if we pick your question, I'll do my best to give a shout out to everybody that had that idea in the video and, and then we'll jump right into it and see what kind of justice we can do it. What about a plus list about things like, uh, a plus list of things about snakes? Gators, kings, boas, retics. Um, I'm not quite sure, Janet, what uh, what you're asking as far as like a plus list, but uh, I have a certain amount of experience, or if I don't know, I usually know people who know about just about any species. So feel free to ask questions about other species. I'll help you answer them as best I can. And, and my hope too, guys, is even though I'm a dwarf and super dwarf retic breeder, a lot of these tips that I'm giving are across the board for reptiles or at least widely applicable. So um, I, I have no problem answering stuff about, about whatever. What's up, Rude Dog? Thank you very much. All right, let's see. Temps are 91 on the hot side. Makes sense. There you go. Usually when they're pushing, they're, they're hot. Everyone thinks they're hungry. Usually they're just hot. So let's see. Hi, Wicked Vixen. How you doing? Color change from hatchling to adult. Oh, that's a good one. <clears throat> uh, especially where it, it concerns some of the morphs and and I do have some kind of more advanced morphs that you don't often see in adults so maybe we'll have to do some of that stuff so show some of the color changes I might be able to do that in one of my collections video where I can say here's my adult this is what she looked like as a baby 
and you guys can kind of see how those develop. That some of the stuff like anneries, marbles, uh, which are, happen to be some of my favorite morphs, are the ones that really uh, color up well when they grow. So that's a that's a good one, Mike Douglas. Thank you very much. All right, make a video about snakes going off food, please. I do have a video about help my snake won't eat. If you're talking about uh, like ball pythons putting themselves on fasts, that's kind of the bane of a ball python keeper. I'm not sure if that's what you're talking about, but uh, I don't know if there's any easy answer to that. Let them go a little while, get hungry, and then throw them something like a gerbil that uh, to try to mix it up or, or maybe a chick so that you can get them on eating something again and then try to switch them back. But they are frustrating for that kind of stuff. Um, true classic. Do you specify the locality with dwarves and super dwarves? Yeah, actually, absolutely. I have all the percentages. And in most cases, a lot of people that are producing super dwarves, even if they can tell you the percentage of locality, they're like, well, it's because I bought the parents as such and such. Um, but with most of my animals, I can actually walk you back to whatever the original imported animal was or, or whoever bred the animal. And I'm actually working on some different, uh, almost like dog pedigrees for this stuff so that we can see not only locality specific information, but also the bloodlines. Like this new bloodline that hatched is from a male snow that I have here called White Diamond. Um, it's, White Diamond is not a morph, it's the name of that male. And he's spectacular and he throws spectacular looking babies. So if you wanted the best of the best of the best snow line stuff, you know, and you can you can then say, is this a white diamond line? That's what I want to get into because I want to make really amazing looking things and I'm willing to pay a little bit more for it. Um, I'm going to try to do that so that not not to charge more for everything, but so that, that the bloodlines have been really refined over time um, are appreciated the way that they should be. So yeah, I, I uh, do specify the locality. I also breed with pure locality stuff. Most of the time, most of the time, uh, if someone's talking about dwarfs, they're either wrong and they're saying it's because of some morph that started out a dwarf, or they're referring to jampeas. That's the most common dwarf uh, that we see bred in captivity. And if they're talking about super dwarfs, most of the time they're talking about kalatoa. So, um, and, and a lot of the common stuff is that way. The other localities are, are still very rarely represented uh, within collections in the United States. And where they are, a lot of times they're wild caught animals that aren't breeding regularly and haven't been bred into multiple generations. So there are exceptions, but that's where it is. Average price for a super dwarf. Uh, average would be somewhere in the middle, but the a super dwarf cross that's like a male is gonna be your cheapest, a normal, like maybe a, just a normal 50% super dwarf. Um, I start mine out at about 350 bucks. The most expensive one I have in stock right now as a baby is 15000 So it ranges a lot. But uh, the best thing that you can do, Paula, is uh, send me a private message or uh, well, I guess this isn't Facebook. You can't private message. But you can email me, Garrett at ReachOutReptiles.com and let me know what you're looking for. Tell me what your price range is or what you would like to spend on your first Super Dwarf. And, um, and, you know, we'll work something out. We'll find you something that you enjoy that's really good looking within your price range. That's the way I do things. All right, guys, don't let it end here. If you have an awesome idea, always feel free to jump back on this and uh, comment down below with your ideas. Like I said, it doesn't matter how old the video gets. I, I read every single comment that you guys ever post. So keep commenting on this thing. Keep this thing going. And I'll continue to refer back to it for great ideas for free tips on Friday. Hey, I am off to the Steel City Reptile Expo, so if you guys are anywhere in the vicinity of Pittsburgh and you wanna keep, come see some of the awesome Super Dwarf babies, hold them, look at them in person, come by and see me at the booth all the way in the back, but it's the big one. And um, I will see you guys there. Everybody take care and have a great night.